four different things that can kill your dreams, that can kill the vision for this church. And then I want to talk to the church at the end of my message for a minute or two, okay? And uh, at that time, I want the, the, the Facebook live streaming to be cut off when I'm talking to the church. Right now, it's okay. Amen. So four factors. I, I have identified four factors. I have uh, only limited time this morning, so I'm going to run right through it and, uh, and, and see what is your problem? What is keeping you from fulfilling your dreams? What I, want to, uh, what I want to do today is at the end I will talk about our church, but I want to talk to you individually. You know, I want you to identify what is stopping you from fulfilling your dreams. What is stopping you from going forward? What is stopping you from uh, getting out of the rot that has come into your life? How come you are stuck? in 2017 where you were in 2016 how come there is no progress in your life if you take a time to think about it you will identify the factors and you can take care of the factors amen hallelujah now the first thing i'm going to talk to you about is self doubt self doubt is also another word for a another word for a you know so lack of self confidence go to the next slide please on the on the on the powerpoint I wanted to pay, no, one before that, before that, okay? I wanted to pay attention to this, uh, uh, this slide for a minute. It's not in your book, uh, notes, okay? See, this is a statement from Helen Keller. How many of you know who is Helen Keller? Helen Keller was a, a, a girl who was blind and mute and deaf, okay? Think about a person who is blind, mute, and deaf. She had a teacher, fortunately, who decided to invest her, the teacher's life into this young woman and find a way to communicate with her. And you know how, they, how, they, how the system that they developed was communicating her, typing on her palm, typing letter by letter on her palm. I don't know whether they use Morse code or whatever, but they found a way. And, and, and she was slowly Helen Keller you know, realize what she was trying to say, and she became an expert. And they say that she could communicate so fast with her finger by typing on the hands of her teacher that we, uh, she could go faster than I am preaching right now. Amen? And, but, but this girl, you know, uh, uh, after she became a woman, she became a very famous person. She traveled the world, talked to people. And uh, this is what she said, you know, in one of her famous statements. The only thing... Worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. Think about that for a minute. And this is written by a woman who was blind, deaf, and mute. And she said the only thing worse than being blind is having vision, having sight, but no vision. A lot of people have sight, but no vision, no plans for the future. And this woman overcame all those things that were standing against her and became a person who impacted a generation. Now she's impacting multiple generations. Okay, so don't tell me that you are not good for anything. Don't tell me what can I do. Don't tell me I cannot do anything faster. Don't tell me that I don't have the proper education. Don't tell me that I do not have the proper upbringing. Don't tell me that I didn't go to school for too long. Don't tell me that I don't have any, any special talents. You're more than enough to make a difference in your life and in the life of others. Amen? You just have to wake up and see who you are because God did not waste his time to create you. You are a special creation endowed with the special talents, endowed with the special giftings. And I told you the one once before this year that there is nobody, absolutely nobody like you in the world. Amen? Your fingerprints are different than everyone else. Even your retina scan is different from everyone else on the face of the earth, even though we are reaching 7 billion people on the face of the earth today. There is absolutely nobody like you on the face of the earth. Amen? So the question is, what are you going to do with your life? Amen? So you have to identify what is stopping me. What is my weakness? And once you identify that, you can rectify that, and you can go on in life. Amen. And you can uh, fulfill your dreams. So I started talking about self-doubt. I'm just going to quickly show you examples from the Bible so it will become very clear to you. Amen. And uh, the example for that I want to show you is the king Saul, the first king in Israel. 
And you know how he is introduced to us in the pages of the Bible in 1 Samuel? There was no one more good looking than Saul in all of Israel. What an introduction <laughs> of a young man. There was no one more good looking than Saul in all of Israel. Number one. Number two, there was no one more taller than Saul in all of Israel. So imagine a person six feet five inches tall minimum in my thinking, amen, and had better looks than Paul Newman or Robert Redford and all these people put together, amen. And that's the person whom God chose to make the first king in Israel. Outwardly, number one. Outwardly looking so good. Outwardly, there's no one to compare to. Such a great personality. But inwardly, he was a coward. You know, he did not have the self-confidence. And we don't know why. The Bible does not tell us why. Because he was, and, and, and number three, I have to give you one more thing. Number three, he was one, one of the wealthiest families in all of Israel. So, he had a proper upbringing. He had no problems, you know, no financial issues that you know, affected his self-confidence. We don't know what affected self, his self-confidence, but that was his uh, downfall. Because he did not expect to become a king. And people were asking for a king. If you know the story, he was actually looking for the donkeys that belonged to his father. And then along the way, as he was passing by, he decided to come to Samuel for direction to find out where his donkeys are. He did not come seeking guidance for his future. He came seeking guidance to find out his donkeys. That's how small his thinking was. Are you with me? Can you imagine you're traveling from a faraway place and there's only one prophet in Israel at that time and you're fortunate enough to get an audience with that, with that prophet and all you, have to talk, all you talk about is donkeys. Never ask one question to the prophet about yourself. Never bring yourself into the picture. See, because some people are so narrow-minded, they think so small. And that's, such people cannot have confidence. Amen? But nonetheless, God had chosen him because people wanted a king that looks like, looks good. Amen? So God said, okay, I'm going to give you a good-looking king. I'm going to give you a tall king. When he stands next to, next to the other world leaders, other kings, you know, he will look very tall. Last week, last week you saw, or two weeks ago, you saw the picture of uh, President Trump with all the European leaders. Did you notice how tall he is compared to all the European leaders? So he looks good, good, you know, good physique and everything. But this man had no confidence and also did not value what God was doing in his life. Do you know he, you know the story, I have to run through this message. So Samuel said, listen, I have something special, something unexpected in your life. Because God has chosen you to be the king. The very first king in Israel. And you are not expecting it. Unexpectedly, the greatest blessing is coming into your life. And Samuel anointed him as king. But do you know, when you read the Bible, when he went back home, he only told his father about the donkeys. He never told his father about what happened to him. So the family didn't know that this man was anointed. The son was anointed as a king. So a few days later, Samuel had to come to their home and make this news public. So Samuel decided to come there and said, set up a big festival. I'm coming with good news to your family. And Samuel came. And when Samuel is ready to announce the good news, they're looking for this man and they cannot find him. You know what the Bible says? He went and hid himself under the stack of hay. A six feet five man crawling under a stack of hay and hiding from the public side. Why? He knew why Samuel is coming for. He was scared to death about what God was doing in his life. The fact that he was about to become a king. You know, and then Samuel made it public. And then people were very happy. People rejoiced and accepted him as king. And I have told you that anytime God selected uh, someone into a leadership position, there will be somebody to go with that leader. That's the principle universally you see in the Bible. Amen. And even in our life we see, if you are a real leader, there will be always somebody to follow you. And that's one measurement of leadership. Amen. So the people accepted him. He became the leader. 
and uh, the anointing was upon him. The next chapter we see some uh, people coming to attack, at a king called Nahash coming to attack the people of Israel and all of a sudden the anointing on his life, you know, woke up and he invited people to come and join with him to go into the battle and, uh, and people came. Thousands and thousands of people came, stood with him and they went into the battle and won the battle. But that's the only time we see the anointing on his life manifesting. Are you with me? See, one good thing about anointing is that anointing will manifest at the time. You don't have to tell anybody that you are anointed. Thank you, sister, for being here with us this morning. When she came to sing, I do not know about you, but I could sense the anointing upon this woman's life. You see, that's what anointing does. Anointing manifests itself. And this man was anointed, but this is the only time the anointing manifested in the life of King Saul. Because when we come to the next chapter, again you see he's retreating because he never overcame his inner problem of lack of self-confidence. You see, all, I, all of a sudden we see the Amalekites coming to attack him. And by that time he has a son, Jonathan, who is, has become a young man. And he's watching his dad. And he's seeing that dad is hiding always. You know, dad is hiding always. Dad is not providing leadership. Dad is hiding always. So eventually in that chapter, you see, so Jonathan called his armor bearer and said, listen, I'm going to take a step forward. I'm going to step up because my dad is not stepping up. And by little or by much, God can take care of us. So let's go. And they started the process. And then there was a great sword. Of God gave a victory to Israel, etc. Because this man did not overcome. And even after his son did that, he didn't say, he didn't go home and think that, man, this is a shame. Because my son has a lot more confidence than I. And I am the king. And when I am on the throne, and when I am carrying the crown on my, uh, on my head, you know, it's, it's a shame for my son to take the leadership. So let me change my ways. He didn't. Because in the next chapter, or two chapters later, when you come, you see Goliath all of a sudden in the scene, and shouting from the mountain top and saying, listen, I know you have an army there, but I don't want the whole army. I don't want to fight the whole army. I'm a warrior. Do you have one warrior among you? Send him over. And naturally, who do you think people looked at? Come on. Who do you think people looked at? People looked at their, their king, Saul. And when people looked at the Saul, the Saul was hiding behind a stone. The leader who should have gone and confronted Goliath was hiding behind a stone. How many days Goliath challenged Israel? For 40 days. And 40 days, Saul went and hid himself behind a stone. So God had to do something else. God brought, uh, brought uh, David on the scene, and we know David went and uh, defeated Goliath, and Israel had victory again. The story doesn't end there. Then all of a sudden, the people were happy because people want leadership. Listen, every organization needs leadership. Every community needs leadership. Amen? And we all know that, we're, you know, I don't have time to digress today. Because what, when some of our leaders, even in politics, they do crazy things, we all cringe. Because they may, we are not related to them or anything, but they are our leaders. Amen? So every community needs leaders. So the community of Israel was happy. A young man has come forward. Yes, our king has a problem. But there is somebody else now who can step in and take care of things now. So they started singing along the street. What did they sing that day? Saul killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. All of a sudden... King Saul became very jealous. See, that's one of the fundamental problems of people without self-confidence. They become jealous for little things. As soon as God starts using somebody, they become jealous. Or somebody do a little better than them, they become jealous. And the Bible says that it's from that day his mind changed. Now he got used to the crown. He used, got used to the palace. So at any cost, he just wanted to save his crown and at the palace, but not interested in being the leader. So you know what he, was, what he thought? I need to kill David. Because David is a challenge to me now. So the only way I can preserve my throne is by killing David. So from that day on, his thinking changed. He allowed Satan to enter into his mind when he started premeditating murder. And the en enemy came in, Satan came in, and you know the story, it was a downhill journey from there for King Saul 
and uh, in the end, he died in a battle. And he and his son also died in that battle. You know why he had, why he died like that? Because he never overcame his weakness. Listen, none of us are perfect. All of us have issues. Some of the issues we are born with. Amen. You may have a speech problem that you are born with. You may have a confidence problem you are born with. You may have a, a decision-making problem that you are born with. But none of that should stop you from reaching your dreams. None of that should become an excuse. Because you have a lifetime to get over it. This man had almost 40 years. You know, he died 40 years later. You know, what does that tell me? He had 40 years, 40 long years to solve his problem. Never did. Never did. Died on the mountains of Gilboa. And David had to write a, a beautiful song in remembrance of him. And he asked a question. Why did he die like that? Why did he die? He didn't have to die like that. He had 40 years to solve a problem. Listen, I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what has held you back in the past. Maybe your upbringing has held you back. Maybe your family has held you back. Maybe your uh, inability to do well in school has held you back. But none of that has to stop you from reaching your dream. Amen? Because God is here to help you. God is here to help you. you. All you have to do is come to God and say, Lord, this is where I am. Amen. Change me. Change me. Move in my life. Change me. All of you know the prayer of Jabez. What was the problem with Jabez? Jabez was not a great man. What was the problem with Jabez? Jabez was born and his mother named him son of sorrow. And he carried a stigma upon his life. I don't know what happened. Probably he had some birth defect or something. And then he, all he did was he came to God and said, Lord, if you hear me, if you hear my prayer and change my life, then I will bless you. And we know the end of that story. He became greater than all of his brothers. That means his brothers were doing good. God took him beyond where his brothers were. Nothing has to stop you. Amen? Hallelujah. You just have to wake up. You have just have to come to God. Do you know who is the wisest man in history as far as the Bible is concerned? Solomon, right? We consider Solomon as the wisest man. But I don't think Solomon was very wise when he was born. Do you know when he became wise? When he was anointed as king and God allowed him an encounter with God. You know, and God asked him, ask me anything, and I'm going to bless you with anything that you ask me. And he said, Lord, you have put me as a leader for this big nation, and I don't know how to rule over them. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. And God changed his mind. God changed his mind, and he became the wisest man on the face of the earth. A few years ago, a young man, he, he, he passed away after that. You know, young. He came here. I shared his testimony. I think it was here or when we were in another building. This man had failed high school four times. Four times failed high school. And everybody written him off. But then he went to hear a gospel message and he gave his heart to Jesus. And he heard the message that Jesus can change anyone. So he went to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you can change anyone, change me. You know, I cannot pass high school. I written the exam four times. I'm failing, failing, failing. Change me. And you know what? You know what? Jesus changed him. Jesus changed him and he continued his education and took three master's degrees in three different topics. Don't tell me that God cannot change you. Don't tell me that God cannot change your circumstances, your situations. Amen. Refuse. Become a little stubborn this morning. Refuse to give up on your dream. God will take you forward. Amen? Hallelujah. I had to run. Second thing I want to emphasize is negativity. Negativity. You know, one of the best things you, are, you can do for yourself is not hang out with people who are negative. When you start hanging out with people and they find out they are, they are so negative, just walk away. Okay? Because you have to overcome negativity to reach your goal in life. Amen. I'm going to show you two examples. 
One is the life of David. Okay, the look at the notes. I have four different points there. When David was young and was anointed, and he was ready to do great things, you know, he had to overcome a lot of negativity. Because was, first of all, his father didn't think much about him. Hello. I don't know how many, if anyone who can identify with that here. His father didn't much think much about him. When Samuel came to his house to anoint one of the children of Jesse as the next king in Israel, the father, Jesse, invited all the kids except David. Because the father didn't think much. Because he was the youngest kid, and some people say probably he was son of a concubine. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, the Bible is not clear on that. But that's one explanation. Why? Otherwise, usually you love the baby of the house more than the older kids. Whatever be, the father didn't think much about him, did not invite him. God had to intervene and make room for him. Amen? Listen, when you are carrying God's favor upon your life, it doesn't matter who does not uh, regard you. It doesn't matter who does not show favor to you. God will step in and make room for you. Hallelujah. That's why I said do not give up. Amen. His father didn't think much about him. Secondly, his brother didn't, brothers didn't think much about him. When he ended up in the battlefield and uh, he heard Goliath shouting and, and he, he started saying, okay, if somebody go and kill this man, what is the reward for killing this guy? And all of a sudden the news started spreading and the news reaches all the brothers who are all graduates of military academy. But none of them had the boldness to go and confront this man. But when the younger brother came and said, okay, I will go and confront this guy, they got jealous. They turned around and they got on his case and said, we know you. You think you are somebody. That's basically what they said. If I paraphrase it, you always think you are somebody, but you are a little kid. What do you think? We are the graduates of military academy. If we are afraid to go and confront this guy, how are you going to confront him? Because I have the anointing of God upon my life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I may be younger than all of you, but I carry the anointing of God upon my life. Amen. I may not have gone to the military academy, but I carry the anointing of God upon my life. I may not have experience, but I have the anointing. See, the anointing makes such big change. Hallelujah. And they told him, Listen, we gave a bunch of sheep for you. Listen to me. I wish I had more time. You know, they told him, because other people, when you depend on people, people will put a limit upon your life. They will put a limit upon your life. And within that limit, you are okay. But once you want to break out of that limit, they don't like it. Yeah. Am I talking to somebody here? Yeah. Amen. Am I talking to somebody? Somebody understand what I'm trying to say? Amen. The older brothers look at him and say, we entrusted you with a bunch of sheep. What were they saying? You are only good enough to watch the sheep. <laughs> you are not good enough to wage a battle. That was the limit that they had put on him. I do not know where you come from. I do not know what's the limit that people put on your life. You know, some people may look at you and say, you are only good enough to live in a basement. Ha! When you try to, when you dare to think about dreaming, uh, dream about owning a home, people will say, you? You're going to buy a house? You're only good enough to live in the basement. People have limits on your life, whether you want it or not. Amen. People are not fair all the time. But the question is, are you going to subject yourself to the limits that others have placed upon you? Or are you going to break free today? And saying that God is with me. If God is with me, if the anointing is upon my life, with my God, I can run towards an army and I can overcome an army. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Number three, negative remark. The king didn't think much about him. <laughs> when the news finally reached the king, he called uh, David and looked at David. Hmm. I heard somebody wanted to go and confront Goliath. But you? You know, the King James Bible says he was ruddish on his face. To me, it means that he didn't even have mustache or beard. You know, the Jewish men always have beards. And this is a little boy, don't even have a beard yet. And the king is saying, you are a little guy, you are a little boy. 
And that man has many years of experience waging battle. How are you going to go after a, against a warrior like this? You're a little boy. But you're, let me tell you, David had an answer to the king. And you know what was the answer? His testimony. When people question you, make sure you have a testimony as an answer. Don't get into an argument with them. Don't try to win an argument. Share your testimony. Amen. And David said, listen, I remember where I came from. After I received the anointing and I went back to the wilderness to take care of my father's sheep, there was a lion that jumped on me and, uh, and, and it, it came to grab a sheep. But I don't think it came to grab the sheep. It came to finish off David before anyone else will find out this boy carries an anointing. Are you listening to me this morning? Before you come to the limelight, he wants to finish you off. Before you teach your station in life, he wants to finish you off. If there's a battle in your life today, just notice that. Just remember that. That's because God is taking you somewhere. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Satan doesn't waste his time on people who is going nowhere. Satan target the people who are going somewhere. Satan target the families that are going somewhere. They can target the young people who have huge potentials in the future. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. And once David shared the testimony, Saul also remembered about the days when he carried that anointing. And he knew what the anointing can do. So he blessed him and sent him to confront David. I mean, Goliath. Fourth negative statement. When David was running towards Goliath, Goliath didn't think much about him. Goliath looked at Goliath was looking at her, some, expecting somebody tall like him, big like him, experienced like him, but who came up was a little boy. So Goliath looked down upon him and said, You? Who do you think I am? You think I'm a dog? Because all you, can, all you have is a little stick in your hand. There's a shepherd's stick. And he had a sling in his hand. And who, why are you coming to me with a stick? Don't you know I'm a warrior? I have my own weapons of warfare. Amen. But David did not live in the New Testament time. David said, uh, I come against you in the name of uh, our, uh, our Lord. Amen. And uh, if he lived in the New Testament, he would have said, uh, Yes, I know you have your own weapons of warfare. You have another man carrying a huge spear in his hand. And I know you have bows and arrows and all the weapons that was available at that time. But the weapons of our warfare is not carnal. But it is mighty enough to pull down the Goliaths of the world. Yeah. Hallelujah! So when people come and talk to you negatively, negatively, make sure you have a godly answer. Amen. Do not allow them to affect your mind. Do not allow them to pull you down. Do not allow the negativity to keep you down. Amen. I don't know how many of you went through this kind of attack in recent days, but you have been subject to it. Realize that God has a plan for your life. God is taking you somewhere. Don't listen to the negative talk. Don't listen to the negative talks. Rise above that. Put your trust in God this morning. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Ah, I wish to stay to run. Okay, second example I'm going to show you is from the life of Nehemiah. And all of us know this. Uh, I expect know the, the story of Nehemiah. This man was a cupbearer in King's Palace, in the Emperor's Palace. And then God uh, gave him a burden to go back and build uh, the walls of Jerusalem to summarize it. But when he came back, he came back and he studied everything. He had a plan and everything. But that's a different story. I'm going to talk to you this morning from the point of view of the enemies. When he came and we started making a little noise that these Jewish people who are coming back now, they're going to build this wall. You know what was the first response from the enemies? They turned around and asked, what are these feeble Jews doing? Who do you think you are? You were in 70 years, you were in captivity, in were slaves in Babylon. And now you're just coming by. What do you got? What do you got? How are you going to build this wall? What do you got? You have nothing. You have no history. You have no money. You have no big people backing you up. Nothing. And in the book of uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, 
there are four areas that is uh, um, that is highlighted there. You know, in fact, uh, they turned around in chapter four, at the beginning of chapter four, and they said, uh, "Where are you going to find the stones? Where are you going to find the brick to build this wall?" Because the city was burned down by the Chaldeans. You know, the Jerusalem temple was knocked down by the Chaldeans. All the walls of the city was come down. And on top of that, they put fire to everything. So they said, all you see, wherever you look, all you see is heaps of rubbish, heaps of rubbish. That's all you saw. Once it was a beautiful city, but not now nothing but heaps of rubbish. And they said, how are you going to build out of the heaps of rubbish? One day when I was uh, meditating on that, the Spirit of God started moving in my heart and putting a lot of ideas in my mind. So I put that into a book. Okay? I put that into a book. If you're new to this church, you don't know about this book. All the, all the folks know about this book. The title of this book is Building with Burned Bricks. Because that's all they had. Heaps and heaps of rubbish and burned down bricks. And from chapter 4, the 4, verse 10 and 11, the four areas of loss mentioned there. I'm just going to Read this to you, okay, to save time. Anyone who has gone through the process, the process is, uh, you know, your life becoming a heap of rubbish. You're failing in life and trying to come back from your failures. Can identify with the Jews in the days of Nehemiah. After a while, you get tired of digging through the rubbish of your life. Even when you know there are bricks, and that bricks represent the talents that you once used for the glory of God, the abilities that you once possessed to make a living, etc., etc. Even though you, you know that is still there, and God can recover and use to rebuild your life, you get tired because people look at you and say, you are nothing but a heap of rubbish today. You probably was an anointed man at one time. Probably you was a successful man at one time. But today you are nothing but a heap of rubbish. And how are you going to... But, but the stones are still there. It has burned marks on it, but it's still there because you went through the fire, you went through the destruction. So the marks are there. The tough times have left its mark on you, but it's still there. And you can recover it and rebuild your life. But people will not let you do that because they continuously bring negativity into your life to stop you from start digging and recovering things. Number two, when people are constantly reminding you of your past, all you see is the rubbish. Not the fact that God has already recovered many bricks, albeit they, bur they uh, burn marks and uh, is using you for his glory. You get tired of answering people's questions. You get tired of finding explanation for yourself. You begin to lose hope. And that's what is called the loss of vision. That's a loss of vision. Number three, along the way you will be so tempted to give up on yourself. The process is taking too long. You may say, there's a long way to go before I can reach where God wants me to be again. And I don't think I can make it that far. You may conclude it is not working as fast as I expected. So I might as well give up. Your mind may whisper, there is way too much rubbish piled up in my past. It can never be completely taken care of. You will begin to tell yourself, and that's a loss of confidence. I mentioned in the book of, in the notes. Then, there will be adversaries who are determined to come into your midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. They are not excited that you are on the road to restoration. They have taken advantage of you while you were down. Does it make sense? It is, so, it is to their benefit that the status quo remains. That means you stay down. They, they can continue to take advantage of you. So they will attack you, spread stories about you, slander you every which way they can. This may cause you to be gripped with fear and the desire to give up. And this is the loss of security. Negativity will affect you. By the way, if you want a copy of this book, see me after that, after the service. See, your strength can be destroyed through negativity, continuous negative talking. Your vision can be gone. Your confidence can be gone. Your sense of security in life will be gone. 
But that does not have to stop you. That does not have to stop you. Amen. The greatest lesson in the life of Nehemiah was this. He would not listen to any of that. Amen. There were days when he had to ha carry a sword in one hand and a tool to work in the other hand. But they still continued the work. They still continued the work and they finished. You can reach where God wants to take you. Amen. It doesn't matter how many people are speaking negative things into your life. No. It, cannot, it does not have to stop you. The third thing I want to share with you this morning is this. Fear. Fear is something that will stop you from reaching your potential in life. A greater example for that is Peter. A man who had so much fear in his life. I mean, but he, the good thing is that he overcame that fear and succeeded. So we can learn from him this morning. Listen to me. Well, remember, he was, he was, he was uh, already following Jesus for a while, while they were going into that boat journey. And in the middle of that journey, the storms came out, you know. And Peter was the leader of crying, not the leader of assurance. Peter didn't get up and say, hey, don't worry, guys, Jesus is here. He's going to take care of this problem. No, Jesus, Peter was crying louder than everyone else. And this was supposed to be the leader. You know, this man had so much fear in his heart. Amen. It was fear that caused him one other time to come to Jesus and, uh, and express his concern, his future. Because Jesus started talking about going back to his father. And then all of a sudden, one day, Peter told him, Master, this is your plan? You want to go back to your father? But uh, do you remember that I left my business to follow you? <laughs> I left my boat to follow you. Yeah, you can go back to your father. What about me? What about my future? What about the future of my family? Because he was concerned. He was afraid of his future. Amen. And we all know the story of how he chickened out in front of a little slave girl. <laughs> but everything changed. Everything changed once he witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. He realized that uh, that is not the end of everything. And then on top of that, he got the anointing on the day of Pentecost. And that made him a bold man. The boldness was brought into his life through the anointing. Amen. Until the anointing came, he was a chicken. Amen. But the anointing changed everything. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Amen. Our time is running. But listen to me. When Jesus called Peter, Jesus spoke about the potential of his life. Are you with me? Jesus spoke about the potential of his life. And what did Jesus say? Peter, you're a fisherman today. But from this day forward, you will make, you will become a fisher of man. Amen. I will change you. I'm inviting you to come and follow me because I have plans to change you and make you a fisher of man. So Jesus talked about the potential. Are you with me? Amen. But the problem that Peter had was Peter was caught up in the present day reality. This is where we fail too. Are you with me? Okay, let me explain that. You didn't, you didn't get it. I can see that you didn't get it. Okay? Because when God calls us, God talks about the potential. God talks into our future. God will start talking about where he wants to take you. Where are you going to end up in your life? But the problem that we have is we are too caught up in the present day reality. And Jesus called that the seed that fell among the thorn. Okay, let me explain that um, even though the time is running. This is the problem we have. You know that uh, if I can invest a little money, you can, you, can, you know, if I can muster up a little money and buy a property somewhere, one day it's going to give me returns. When I am ready to retire, I have something there, you know, which will give me income every month. But the present day reality will tell you, look at your paycheck. This is all you're getting. Where is the money to save? We, can, we start thinking about the current bill, the water bill, the car bill, the other bill, the grocery and all. And you will look at the present day reality and say, no, no, that's impossible. So what happens to a lot of people, majority of the people, is they are caught up in the present day reality. Are you with me? And the present day reality never looks so glossy. <laughs> Amen? And if you cannot look beyond that, you get stuck there. Tomorrow you will do the same thing. Tomorrow, the day after tomorrow you will do the same thing. I, I don't know if you, any of you have ever seen that movie called Groundhog Day. You know? 
Every day will become a groundhog day in your life. Because you cannot look past the present day reality. The only people who succeed in life is people who look beyond the present day reality. And look at the future. And think in terms of potential. That's what is going to change you. Amen? Can you turn to somebody and say, I think I have some potential. <laughs> Amen? If you're confident, turn to somebody and say, I know I have some potential. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many years ago, Robert Schuller introduced a term, term called the possibility thinking. Possibility thinking that revolutionized a, a lot of things and became a very big catchphrase in American literature. Think about the possibility. Okay? Think not be stuck in the present day reality. Today you may be sick. Today your bank account may be empty. Today you may owe a lot of money on for credit card. Today you may have nothing but loans and credits in your life. But think about the possibility. Think about the potential. Amen? And when you start thinking about the potential, listen, you can change everything. Okay, you are still not getting it. So let me, let me make it simpler. Okay? Do you know, do you know which is the largest, uh, largest uh, taxi company in the world? It's the largest taxi company in the world. Uber. Do you know Uber does not own one taxi? Uber does not own one taxi. But it has become a global. I was so shocked in April when I was in India. In the city of Bhopal, they have Uber. In North India. They have Uber service in North India. I said, you have Uber here? How did you find out about Uber? Do you know what happened? A man thought about the possibility. And came up with an idea and started testing the idea. And the idea caught on. And in the today's social media world, it ca something catches, it catches fire. It's all be go around the world in no time. Number two, second example. I want to show you two more examples. Do you know which is the largest real estate company in the world? Today, largest real estate company in the world? It's called Airbnb. Airbnb. It's the largest real estate company in the world, worth billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. Do you know they don't own one building? They don't own one building. A man came up with an idea to help people, to encourage people to share bed and breakfast with the tourists who don't have enough money. And the idea just caught on. It went around the world. And in September, we'll be going to South Africa. And you will be in the, in the city of Durban. There will be Airbnb will put you in a, the house of somebody. You can book from New York. And when you're in South Africa, it's ready. Idea. You know why? Because somebody thought about potential. The third example I want to show you. Do you know, have you heard the name of the man Elon Musk? Huh? The, the man who started the company Tesla, the electric car? Okay. But I don't want to talk about that. Okay. That he had uh, some in direct input. But he owns a rocket company. Rocket company. Yesterday he, they, they launched another rocket. You know, called SpaceX. Do you know he didn't invest one dollar from his pocket into that company that sends rocket into space? All the money comes from NASA and U.S. government. Do you know why he was successful? Because he started thinking in terms of potential. Because when they stopped sending, what, what was it called, space shuttle, when they were talking, uh, talking about uh, closing down the space shuttle program, that he knew that somebody has to send rockets up there because every day people are sending rockets up there. Okay? So who's going to do that? And he knew there would be a market for that. And he approached NASA and said, I have some ideas. Can you give me some research grant so I can start groundwork on a company that will eventually send rockets? Do you want to know where he, where he is today? In less than 20 years, he's getting ready to send people to Mars. Power of possibility thinking. Turn to somebody and say, you, have to start, you better start thinking about the potential. Amen? 
Hallelujah. Amen. Turn to that person one more time. All right? And, and, and tell them, stop worrying about groceries. <laughs> tell them, tell them, stop worrying about grocery. Start worrying about your potential. Start thinking about your potential. But life has a way of, life has a way of, uh, you know, shackling us down to the present day realities. So we are always revolving around that present day realities. You know, I need to buy grocery. I need to buy gas. I need to do this. You're never thinking about your potential. You're never thinking about your future. And at the end of your life, your resume will be, I ate 600,000 hamburgers in my life. Think about potential. Amen? Do not allow fear. Do not allow fear to stop you. I have a fear of heights. Okay, I must acknowledge. But I have a good side to me, but I'm, I'm ready to test anything. Okay? So yes, yesterday I almost signed up for some flying lessons. You know, I got a coupon for flying lessons, and then I looked at the plane and wondered, okay, I had to think about it again. <laughs> so <laughs> the plane was so small. Okay, all of us are held down by, but do you know how double amputees, veterans who went to Iraq war or Afghanistan and got both of their legs blown off by an IUD has come by and have, have fitted with uh, artificial legs and climbed to the top of Mount Everest? Double amputees climbing to the top of Mount Everest and we are up to climb at 10 feet high, little branch of a tree. Fear can stop you. Turn to somebody and say, do not allow fear to stop you. Amen. Because you have a future. You have a destiny. You have a potential. You need to fulfill that potential. Amen. Finally. Finally, the fourth thing that can stop you is procrastination. And you know what is procrastination? The act of willfully delaying the doing of something that should be done. Three things quickly and then, then we are done. First of all, procrastination will affect your relationships. Jesus is the one who taught us about that. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, if you know that somebody is offended with you, do not wait. Do not procrastinate. Go and reconcile with that brother right away. Amen. And the same chapter, Jesus told us, settle the matter quickly. Do not let it fester. And do not let it get bigger and bigger and get out of hand. If you settle the matter quickly, then you can overcome that. Amen. Number two. Second thing I want to show you is this. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, Apostle Paul tells us that procrastination will give Satan a foothold. Anytime you, 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 you keep the anger within you. Do not, he said, uh, this is what he said. Uh, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Because when you take time and you keep it there, Satan will use it to come against you. It becomes a foothold for Satan. And, and Satan will begin to, you know, make a plans to destroy you. That's what happened to King Saul when he became jealous of David. Number three, procrastination will bring poverty. There are so many references to that in the book of uh, Proverbs. I just going to have uh, three verses there. I'm just going to read that to you and then we're going to get up and pray. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4 says, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24 says, The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. In other words, somebody is going, going to become your boss. Hello. Amen. When you go to a workplace, sometimes you realize that uh, all of you start at the same level, maybe on the ground floor. Then somebody gets promoter, 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 and he becomes the manager of the place, and you're still working on the ground floor. And you begin to wonder, what happened? We started the same. One day you want to go to him and uh, remind him that we all started the same. And he went to his office, but you had to pass, go past three secretaries before you can get him. And the secretaries will turn you around and send you back to your ground floor. Use the opportunities that God give you. Amen? Do not procrastinate. Do not be diligent in life. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4. 
the sluggard does not plow in the autumn, but he will seek a harvest in the spring and have nothing. All of us have 24 hours a day. 